We're going to start uh, the afternoon session with Dr. Luster's talk, Clinical Considerations in Remnant Ablation and Adjuvant Treatment. Dr. Marcus Luster received his MD degree uh, from University of Essen in 1992. Uh, he first trained in the U.S. Uh, in pediatric hematology oncology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, then uh, went on to complete a six-year fellowship in uh, nuclear medicine at the University of Würzburg, where in 2000, he became a consultant. In 2008, Dr. Luster moved to, uh, to the University of Ulm to become professor of nuclear medicine. In 2013, he became a full professor and chairman of the Department of Nuclear Medicine at the University of Marburg. Dr. Luster uh, has been involved in multiple clinical trials in endocrinology and pediatric oncology, involving uh, several multicenter international trials uh, in differentiated thyroid carcinoma. He is a member of numerous medical societies, including the German Society of Nuclear Medicine, where he is a vice president, the European Organization for Research and Treatment of Cancer, EORTC, Endocrine Tumor Study Group, and European Association of Nuclear Medicine. From 2008 uh, to 2012, uh, he was the chairman of therapy committee for the European Association of Nuclear Medicine and member of scientific advisory board of the National Patient Support Group for Thyroid Cancer. Since October 2014, he is chairing the newly founded uh, thyroid committee of the EANM. And Dr. Luster is currently the chairman of the Department of Nuclear Medicine at the University Hospital of Mar uh, Marburg in Germany. Marcus, stage is yours. Thank you, Cesar. And uh, thank you again for the kind invitation. Um, happy to be part of this prestigious meeting. Let me check for the right presentation. It appears to be this one. And, okay. I think everybody can see my slides now. So um, it's a nice day for such a meeting. In Germany, it's seven o'clock in the evening. It's raining outside. So why not spend the day in front of the computer? My pleasure. Um, I was asked to, to discuss with you some of the considerations around remnant ablation and adjuvant treatment. You heard a lot about that today and um, it also reflects terminology and I'm coming back to that because uh, this terminology is part of the problem. These are my disclosures um, and I'm also cooperating with uh, some of the patient support groups on the national and international basis. As you all know, the incidence of thyroid cancer is rising worldwide, so to speak, and there has been a peak a few years ago, to my knowledge. Um, and that already shows that we're dealing probably with a different entity um, as compared to the 90s of the last uh, century, when uh, Dr. Tuttle and I started our career. Um, we just passed the 55 now, so um, the things have changed. And probably this um, should also be reflected by current guidelines and by current management strategies. Since most of these patients won't suffer from aggressive tumors, but will have smaller tumors, that will be detected earlier. Funny enough, uh, thyroid cancer is a common disease. Um, it's number two in the US, as far as I know, uh, when it comes to young females below the age of 40, less prominent in Europe, um, probably due to iodine supply, but probably due to diagnostic strategies. Um, I believe that the most important influencing parameter for this development will be screening. 
um, patients get uh, investigations for other diseases, uh, get ultrasounds, get palpated. And um, I, I don't show the slide uh, today, but uh, there's a close relation uh, between the density of endocrinologists and the density of ferret uh, cancers. Um, as I already stated, um, we usually come across less aggressive cancers than in the past. And this is also sort of uh, uh, um, shown in the new TNM classification Mike was already alluding to. As you all know, cancer, thyroid cancer has an excellent prognosis. This is data from our own registry. And it's of course uh, based on the old TNM, TNM classification. It basically shows you that only in stage four, the old stage four tumors, the life expectancy of the patients would be worse than in the dotted lines, which is uh, patients uh, age adjusted uh, comparators. Mm. Of course, these data have been derived with also the old management strategies, including total thyroidectomy, TSH suppression, and um, uh, radioiodine therapy. Putting yourself in a patient perspective, probably different things would matter. Um, I always wonder if we get our messages across um, on a regular basis that this is an excellent prognosis um, and that patients shouldn't be too worried. They worry about the impact on their daily life, on their social life, on their business life. And um, they also wonder about the risk of relapsing. And what the crucial question would be is of course, how do we find the optimal or let's say adequate treatment for a given individual? Um, Recently, and uh, some of the previous speakers have been referring to, to this uh, initiative, um, we started an interdisciplinary group and I was happy and honored to be part of that. And the so-called um, Martinique principles um, were uh, uh, um, invented or developed um, and after some time of uh, very tough discussions and harsh editorials, we, I believe we found a basis now to cooperate and to exchange thought without the goal of reaching 100% consensus in every uh, single issue. So um, when we were analyzing why we probably had different views and different approaches, um, we realized that although we were looking at the same uh, patients and the same disease, there is a lot of heterogeneity in our approaches uh, because we don't have the, the same wording, same terminology here. And we also found out quite right away that um, there is no one single way to follow, but it depends on multiple parameters influencing um, the, the strategies which differ from institution to institution and from country to country. Uh, recently, um, the, the first draft uh, was sent to the journal, to European Journal of Endocrinology, um, where we um, under the guidance or the steering of Furio Pacini um, developed the new um, uh, ETA guidelines um, for thyroid cancer management and radioiodine therapy. And that again was a tough case and it took us for more than four years actually to just uh, agree on a set of recommendations. And I'm just showing one here uh, which is, um, uh, of course, one of the, the most uh, intensive debates at slow risk patients and what's the impact of radioiodine therapy. And this is the original wording. We say there's controversial uh, discussion among experts based on the same data and the same evidence. Another achievement of the Emogenic group is that we really try to define the goals of our interventions uh, discriminating remnant ablation, adjuvant treatment, and treatment of so-called known disease, basically metastasis. And that makes quite clear that we have to look at different strategies here 
and that we also have different goals and they should not be mixed up. So to actually argue about uh, different uh, management strategies, you need definitions on selected terms. We discussed patient selection for radioiodine therapy and uh, we found out that there are probably multiple, also unrecognized factors beyond the, the post-operative disease status, like their, the pathology reports um, uh, differ a lot from country to country. So basically um, it all comes down to major gaps in knowledge and a lack of evidence with uh, uh, prospective randomized trials. We already heard that uh, the molecular signature of a tumor is also heavily influencing the uh, uh, uptake and the, the uh, response to, to radioactive iodine. I'm not going to uh, discuss this in depth because we heard about it before and probably will hear about this more in the talks to come. But um, it's not that simple from a nuclear medicine perspective. Sometimes um, it's not easy to say if a patient is positive or negative. There are gray zones, and this also depends on the physics. And I showed this yesterday in my talk um, on, on imaging. The limit of detection to, to see a lesion or to see a remnant is depending on multiple factors, not only on the biology, but also on, on the physics. And it's a function of the acquisition duration. If you scan for five, seven, 10, 15 minutes, and of course the administer, administered activity. And you can see that you can easily increase your sensitivity by a factor of 10 if you administer more radioactive iodine, like in a therapy activity, or if you just go for the symmetry or a scan. So this really makes a difference. And it also has to be corrected for the depth of the organ or of the, the lesion of the tissue. And it also has to be uh, taken into account that the camera performance influences um, uh, your result. And um, this is just an example that a five minute uh, uh, scanning time can be compensated um, and, and the therapeutic uh, uh, administration of 7,000 megabytes, uh, megabytes really makes a difference there in the overall result. Um, probably in the future, and, and, and part of it is just around the corner, we will select patients for um, radio sensitivity uh, and based on radio sensitivity and probably stimulate the NIS and stimulate the radioiodine uptake. Uh, overcoming resistancy or refractoriness. So after some debate and exchange of thoughts and experiences, um, we really found out that there are factors beyond uh, TNM staging, like quality of the ultrasound, um, the TG measurements, and of course, what does a high volume surgeon really mean? As some of you might know, many patients in Europe, especially in Germany, are not operated for thyroid cancer. So the diagnosis is not made to before the actual interventions, but it's found incidentally. So the strategy of the surgeon was not to take out the whole organ. And in the case of a huge goiter, there are remnants, considerable uh, remnants left behind. And this reflects the high uptake and also the presence of a high TG, relatively high TG after surgery. Um, but also within Europe, there is a lot of debate and uh, some of the opponents um, of uh, more liberal use uh, of uh, radioactive iodine uh, live in France, uh, Sophie Levoulou in, in Paris. And um, we, we had a nice debate in one of the last uh, congresses and then and this um, goes to her. The credit goes to her. These are three main questions she posed. How can we follow patients in the absence of an ablation? So we still deal with TG levels that might be changing over time. Can we select patients for ablation just based on a post-operative TG level? Sometimes hard in our hands if you have a TG of 10, 20, 50. 
no big surprise in our hands. And what about ultrasonography? And what is actually known about the efficacy of radioactive iodine? And I'm coming back to that in a minute. Um, after looking at the literature, funny enough, um, some groups would uh, even state that there is a benefit of uh, applying radioactive iodine in microcarcinomas, and others do not see any benefit at all. And uh, again, from a patient perspective, does this really matter or what are uh, relevant clinical endpoints? Mm. It's a big surprise to me that we still don't have a worldwide validated classification of uh, response to therapy in thyroid cancer, especially in radioactive iodine therapy. What are we aiming for? Um, it has been introduced, of course, recently when we were testing the new drugs, but um, our treatment decisions, if we continue, if we stop radioiodine therapy, are still heavily linked to gut feelings and, and, and they differ a lot between institutions. And um, so that makes it hard to compare results from different institutions. We also follow the ATA guidelines in, in many aspects, uh, like uh, the, the definition of uh, response. Um, as you all know, that's something that's really also very helpful in our hands. The meta-analysis of uh, Dr. Saka, which has been cited over and over again, um, is one of the few um, major uh, papers dealing with uh, the, the outcome of these patients. Uh, patients uh, were uh, classified as undergoing radioiodine and are not, and um, they compared cancer mortality and the risk of recurrence. And if this is the original table, but if you look at it a little closer and if you order the, the studies um, by the duration of follow-up, then things become a little clearer. So the series, the case series, the longest follow-up has the greatest impact on mortality and recurrence. Number two would be 12 years. This is uh, the column with follow-up in years. And you still could see um, an impact on recurrence. And number three would be 11 years, and it's the same phenomenon. So we all know that um, to really evaluate uh, treatment success in thyroid cancer, it may take years, uh, well, it suddenly take years, takes years. And so you need a long, decent follow-up to really uh, come to a conclusion. In preparation of the Martinique meeting, the ENM decided to um, go back to the current data that was in, in, in 2018 in preparation for the first uh, Martinique meeting. And we did basically the same, um, but we decided not to do it ourselves, but to hire a, an external agency spe specialized in such assessments. And they did a literature search using Medline and Cochrane Library. They were looking for the terms uh, that are quite obvious and they included systematic uh, reviews, randomized, randomized clinical trials, and cohort studies. And uh, no big surprise, only a few papers made it to the final analysis. Actually, only 11 publications had a certain standard of evidence. There are several case series, and um, the problem again was to find definitive endpoints um, you could base some, some calculations on. So these 11 uh, publications are, are listed here. And again, you can see that the reported outcomes differ a lot. Overall survival, progression-free survival, five-year survival, 10-year um, survival, many different aspects. And, uh, were addressed and of course the goals regarding ultrasound um, or a TG level, some people would call a TG level of below five success, um, very heterogeneous. 
And also the patient samples that were studied differ a lot. So from, from microcarcinomas to stage four intermediate, you can see very inconsistent, so hard to draw any definitive conclusions. These are some of the results and um, actually nothing has changed since 2008. It's still uh, not very consistent. Many of the studies were of limited quality to uh, put it friendly and uh, none of the studies was to be higher than a grade two evidence and it was easy to identify potential confounders. But again, the trend was that larger series and a longer duration follow-up seem to be more likely to demonstrate a benefit. So um, I already mentioned that to my surprise, um, and, and, and two out of four studies dealing with microcarcinoma, they could even show a statistically significant benefit of ILA-131. So um, where does this lead to? I'm not very happy. Um, that we don't have a standardized approach, um, not in Europe, probably also not in the US, not uh, all over the world. This is something I uh, was happy to participate. A friend of mine, Flavio Ferrer from Switzerland, asked a question to the members of the, the third committee of the ENM I was chairing at that time. So eight people answered uh, what they would do with a given patient. And um, let me take you through this uh, cartoon for a second. So you can see that on, on this uh, index cases, if a patient was M100% would uh, apply radioiodine therapy. If the patient was M0, but higher than T2, again, 100%, T2 follicular, and one hundred percent. You can see, with a few exceptions, most of the patients would still receive radioactive iodine in Europe, and that's all over Europe. That's including UK. That's including Italy. Uh, so we have members from all over Europe. Um, quite uh, uh, disappointing to see that if you ask the same group of patients how much they would give, <laughs> then the picture changes. And you could see uh, this is MBQs, uh, uh, so the administered activity on the y-axis, and this is tumor stage on the x-axis. And you can see that from in a T1 and zero from nothing to 3.7 gigabex, and um, let's say in, in this category, T3 and one from 2000 to 6,000, 6, uh, everything is po possible, anything goes. So um, also in high risk uh, patients, the amount of radioiodine that is administered in the first place differs a lot from institution to institution. And yeah, this is, this is uh, quite disappointing. But on the other hand, since we don't have prospective trials, nobody really knows what the optimal approach would be. So one of the solutions to that problem might be to determine the um, amount of radioactive iodine that is really needed in a given patient. That's not, not that simple, of course, not a straightforward concept. It's getting better, we're improving, and, and, and there are many people, especially on the physicist side, dealing with a problem. Our methodology is getting better and better. We have spec CT, we have all kinds of fancy computers doing the calculations, but there's still many impacting factors like receptor expression, bioavailability, what about the blood supply? Um, there's an heterogeneity of, heterogeneity of uptake, and of course, many other individual factors. But basically, um, we stopped treating these two extremes uh, with the same amount of radioactive iodine. So um, these were two individuals on our ward at the same time, the elderly lady, 49 kilos, and a young man, 200 kilos. And the, the blood volume was one of the determinants of the so-called uh, residence time and the dose to uh, the tumor and the dose to the to the critical organs, of course, uh, is completely different. Um, 
this phrase um, comes from, from Glenn Flux, one of the physicists from, from London. Um, at this stage, um, the variations are not based to the symmetry, they're more or less based uh, on, on the nationality of the patient. So Germany, UK, different approach. We try to uh, first analyze uh, the Royal's dissymmetry, and um, there's a few studies showing that you need a certain amount of dose, 300 gray for remnant, maximum the old data, but still a landmark study. Um, others show that um, 50 to 60 gray to a remnant, again, determined with different tools might be sufficient um, to destroy the remnant. Uh, but if you have a look, at the doses that are really achieved in the tissue, they differ by a factor of 50. Mm. So can we treat according to the symmetry? We're getting there, we're working on it. And is it really superior? There's one retrospective study showing the opposite, uh, several studies in, in favor of the symmetry, but uh, so far we can't really state that we show, uh, did show the superiority this is a comparison of uh, two institutions that were already mentioned, like the MSKCC in New York and uh, our friends in Paris, and they could not show a difference using um, a, a dissymmetry, individual dissymmetry at the one institution and uh, not using that uh, in Paris. So from a nuclear medicine, medicine perspective, there are some general ideas I'd like to uh, mention at the end of my talk. There are two approaches. One is more like the radiation oncology, like, like if you do an external beam uh, uh, radiation, you calculate the dose first, and then of course you administer your therapy. And the other one is the chemotherapy approach. You just give your, your radiative iodine until you run into heavy side effects. So these are the two uh, uh, parties in, in our specialty. And um, yeah, it's, it's a tough fight even within our community. Um, clinical impl uh, implementation of dissymmetry has become easier because of the tools I already mentioned, and we're still lacking the proof of superiority, but uh, no doubt I'm a believer. <laughs> And, and it also has become more important in other and growing nuclear medicine uh, therapies like in new endocrine tumors and recently, of course, prostate cancer, where the organs at risk of difference and the, the, the dose to the tumor plays an extraordinary role. Like if you have an end-stage prostate cancer patient, the, the balance, uh, the risk-benefit uh, balance and the discussion is different as compared to thyroid cancer. So we're part, we're happy to be part of a Medirat project. We are aiming to uh, develop new tools uh, to really standardize the symmetry. We recruited a hundred patients um, together with um, friends in, in, in France and, 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 and uh, UK. Um, all the calculations are done while I'm talking and we will show what the actual dose is to the thyroid remnants and the organs at risk will be. And that's the first time that we have such an international consortium and we can build on that and probably come up with uh, some numbers that will help us in, in, in uh, optimizing radioiodine therapy. There are certain challenges. Um, it still will be hard to predict cure just based on, on the uh, uh, grays or rats delivered to tumor but at least we pro can probably spare patients from radioiodine uh, who will not benefit and we can probably uh, get a better insight of the risk uh, of bone marrow depression or other secondary malign malignancies. This is um, just the final part of my talk. Um, um, I think uh, Dr. Greenspan was talking about that yesterday as well. So far, it's uh, still an open question if uh, uh, um, radioactive iodine leads to a higher rate of malignant neoplasms. Um, this is just an example. It shows you meta-analysis and the risk of uh, secondary cancers. And this is a factor of one. And you, see, you can see on the left-hand side, radioiodine 
would have a protective impact on the right hand side, this would be an increased risk. So it's hard to say, and these are all, again, retrospective studies, and there is certainly bias to it. Again, as a nuclear medicine doctor, you would love to see a correlation between the administered uh, activity, call it dose, and uh, the risk factor. You can see that in the low range, there is some kind of an effect, probably not statistically significant, and in the range of 40 to 60, and even above 40 gigabacks, this is where the trouble starts. These are critically ill patients um, with lots of metastasis. You treat them over and over again. We're in the range of a few thousand millicuries, and, and, and this is done for stabilization of the disease. And this is when the, the risk of secondary malignancies, including leukemia, is really relevant to my understanding. Final case, um, uh, just to illustrate why we believe that to base your decision on um, imaging and TG alone um, is not enough. This was a young female kid, PT2 tumor. Um, probably the rate of uh, lymph nodes effective is a little irritating, but uh, she was operated in, in, in another hospital. They also did an MRI of the neck. They found nothing um, pathological around the structure, probably parathyroid. This is the original report, no metastasis. No metastasis on the chest CT. Few oval lymph nodes, but with an echogenic hilus, probably benign on neck ultrasound. And I don't know why they did an abdominal ultrasound. And these are the post-therapy uh, uh, images from, from our ward. And you can see this is heavily affected uh, patient with the uterine remnant here, probably tumor and several lymph nodes. And the TG that was reported from outside was four. So um, it's not straightforward in many cases, of course, I know you can show anything with one patient, but this is real world experience in our hands. And Again, a few days later, the star phenomenon, there's a lot of tissue left behind. So I'd like to conclude that it's still a surprise to me that after more than 70 years of using recombinant TSH, we still don't know what, the opt what is the optimal way or the adequate way forward. We don't know how much to give, who will actually benefit, but uh, of course, we still believe in the therapy and um, hope that there is a bright future for radioactive, radioactive iodine also with the help of redifferentiation. And I thank you for your attention. Final shot from the marketplace in Marburg. Thank you very much.